Listener Production. Hello, Sasha Barber Gap with you for this bonus episode of The Briefing. It was a huge moment last night when, after a 14-year ordeal, Julian Assange stepped onto Australian soil as a free man. The 52-year-old WikiLeaks founder has been fighting serious charges in the US of obtaining and disseminating classified military documents that exposed war crimes by American soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan. As part of his bid to avoid extradition from the UK, he spent seven years holding holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy in London before he was eventually arrested in 2019. Assange went on to spend five years in Belmarsh prison and suffered serious mental and physical health issues as a result. But after striking a plea deal with the US, Julian Assange yesterday was free to fly home to Australia and reunite with his loved ones. Assange has his supporters and his detractors, but whether you believe he is a hero or a criminal, it can't take away from what a huge moment this is. Today, I'm joined by Julian's brother, Gabriel Shipton, to find out how Julian has spent his first hours as a free man and what's next for the WikiLeaks founder. Gabriel, thanks so much for joining us on the briefing this morning. Obviously an absolutely huge moment overnight in Australia with Julian uh, landing back home. Tell us about the moment you found out that he was going to be free. Well, I went to see Julian uh, maybe a month, a month or so ago and uh, he mentioned that, oh, you know, things are progressing <laughs> and that, that he might be be out soon uh, and, I really didn't think much of, of it on, <laughs> at the time. Um, I, I sort of went about, uh, you know, continuing our advocacy. I, I went to see him and then I flew directly uh, to the United States, to Washington, and I was lobbying in Congress and things like that. Uh, I didn't think much of, of it at the time, but, uh, uh, you know, about a week ago uh, it became uh, a lot more concrete and uh, started to hear from Julian regularly um, and he was calling me and describing, uh, you know, the logistics and all the details as they progressed each day, uh, how he would uh, leave uh, the prison uh, very early in the morning so as not to be detected um, and, and different different things like that. The stop off in Guam that they had to do to um, put in that plea deal in a US territory all these little bits and pieces that were locking in over the last week. It was um, it all came together really, really quickly. Mm. So, how is he feeling? Look, uh, he was at that time. He was feeling very excited, uh, very excited and anxious, but um, mostly excited. Uh, and you know, thinking about what he was going to do in Australia. You know, hear the birds sing. Uh, he was talking about uh, the places that he used to go in Melbourne and how he, how he could manage to visit them again. Uh, now because, you know, obviously now it's 14 years later, uh, Melbourne's changed, but also Julian's changed a lot. Uh, he's a lot older um, and his profile, uh, he didn't have the note. He, he's uh, a, lot, a lot more famous. <laughs> um, so just walking around the streets of Melbourne, uh, I don't know, it's, it might be a little bit of an impossibility for him now. So he wanted to walk around at night maybe and uh, try and uh, go around incognito. Uh, to see all the places that he used to like to visit. Yeah, that uh, white hair is pretty iconic now as well. I think he'd have a hard time even at night trying to hide. Look, this has been such a long time coming. Did Julian and did your family ever expect it to happen and happen as it has so quickly? Well, uh, we've been campaigning for Julian's freedom for a very long time and we always had, uh, or I always had, I can speak for myself, that I always had faith. Uh, that one day Julian would be free. Uh, you know, everywhere we go, everywhere we campaign, everybody we explain this to, or most people we explain this to, uh, they come over to Julian's side. They realise what's at stake in terms of their rights, uh, you know, freedom of the press, that essential part of democracy, Julian's human rights that have been under attack for the last 13, 14 years. People come uh, over to Julian's side. And so I really had faith that eventually we would get to that critical point where the um, the political cost of this case would get to a point uh, where the US would have to uh, really look look at it and think, well, how are we going to get out of this? Yeah, I always had faith that uh, Julian would be out of prison one way or another, but, yeah, it's taken a long time and many, many 
thousands upon thousands of people all around the world advocating for him, politicians in Australia, in Germany, in the United States, in Congress, all over the, in many parliaments all over the world, all, all calling for Julian's freedom. Uh, and the Australian government has really taken the ball and, and uh, you know, taken it over the line with this diplomatic miracle that they were able to achieve with this plea deal. Uh, I can't imagine, you know, how they did it, how they really gave the national security DOJ uh, what they wanted with this guilty plea, uh, but also secured Julian's freedom. But I think, you know, reading the, reading the plea, it is concerning for, for journalists and uh, for press freedom. It essentially criminalises, if you read it, it's essentially criminalising the source journalist relationship as well as uh, possessing and publishing classified information. So in that respect, it's very, very worrying. And now that the DOJ has concluded its process, we believe this leaves it open for the Biden administration to pardon Julian, uh, that there's no longer a DOJ process that they uh, have been saying they can't interfere with. So now I think the Biden administration could take up a lot of goodwill by pardoning Julian and uh, wiping this attack on press freedom off the books. Is that something that Anthony Albanese has signalled he'll support in making direct appeals to Joe Biden to pardon Julian Assange? Uh, no, he hasn't indicated any any support for uh, that sort of position. From his press conference uh, last night, uh, it seems like this matter is concluded for the government. Uh, you know, Julian's home, safe and sound. He's with his family uh, and uh, the government has done their job in protecting uh, this Australian. So I think that's going to be up to up to us, up to the campaign and all the people uh, who have been around Julian and, and had lobby, have lobbied for him, uh, all the press freedom organisations who have written multiple letters to the Biden administration calling on, on him uh, to drop this because of the threat that it poses to uh, the First Amendment, uh, as well as the New York Times uh, and other advocates inside the Congress who are all very concerned uh, about the use of the Espionage Act to go after a publisher. Now, you're in France, you're not in Australia, so you haven't seen Julian in the flesh as of yet. But can you describe to us, knowing, you know, having been in touch with him and the family, what do the next 48 hours to a week look like for Julian? What is he hoping to do? Who does he want to see? Where does he want to go? Like, how is he going to celebrate this first week in freedom? Well, I think it's going to be an incredible shock, uh, an incredible shock for Julian. Uh, he's been picked up out of a two by three metre jail cell, uh, spent a couple of days on a small aeroplane, uh, and now he's you know popped into Australia. Uh, and this whole process has really taken its toll on him. Uh, this never ending legal proceeding, uh, this extradition hanging over his head has really taken a toll. I was reading something by Peter Grester, who was in prison in uh, Egypt today, and he was describing what he went through uh, when he was removed from prison and, and eventually brought back to Australia and the feelings of joy, but also those feelings of being overwhelmed and, and really uh, adjusting to your surroundings. And I think J Julian's going to need some time to do that, um, some real time, some peace and quiet. Uh, to, to have that happen. And, you know, obviously as Julian's family, we're all here to support him uh, and make sure that he has everything he needs to get better. Uh, and I just hope, uh, yeah, I hope he's able to enjoy being with his children uh, and being with his wife, Stella. It was, uh, you know, it brought me to tears watching them embrace last night on the television <laughs> from France. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a you know, magical moment um, watching Julian return to his family, hugging my father and things like that. It was um, very special. Yeah. Look, you touched on it a little bit there, but obviously this has been an extraordinarily difficult time for Julian, uh, not only physically but mentally as well, obviously. How is his health? Is he doing okay in that department? Well, he's got a few like, physical conditions that have been exacerbated by the prison, but by been in these uh, prison, uh, the maximum security prison. He did have a minor stroke uh, while he was inside outside the prison. Uh, so he can get better from that. He's on medication for those sorts of things. The UN actually found and went and visited him in 2019 with two 
expert uh, torture doctors and they found that he was suffering the effects of psychological torture uh, back in 2019. And those doctors have told me and my father that he can get better, that he can recover from that, uh, but but he needs some time to do that. And so I hope that, yeah, I, I'm hoping that he can just rest, relax, uh, recover from what he's been through this, uh, you know, the UN calls it psychological torture. Can you believe it? This Australian has mm. been tortured in the in the prison in the United Kingdom for the last five years. It's a complete disaster. But we're just so happy that he's back, uh, that he's back, and he's been able to survive. Uh, he's been able to hold on uh, long enough for for this to happen and for him to come back to Oz. Mm. Look, as you've mentioned, and, and Stella has as well in her remarks last night, that Julian needs time, he needs space, he needs peace, he needs privacy. Uh, any plans for the future, I'm sure, are very far in the future at this point in time. But I'm sure a lot of people will be wondering if Julian plans to return to his work. Will he return to WikiLeaks? Will he look to continue uh, his fight as what he calls it for freedom of speech and upholding press freedoms um, and exposing wrongdoings? Well, I'm sure Julian will find a way to you know, continue his legacy. Uh, he's been fighting for justice and fighting injustice all his life. And I don't expect him to stop doing that, uh, whether that's through WikiLeaks or some other vehicle uh, or, you know, some advocacy that he'd like to do. I'm sure he's going to uh, continue contributing in a positive way to our society, to our to humanity. Gabriel Shipton, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today and to step us through what it's been like for Julian. You're his brother. You're probably one of the people who know exactly how tough it's been. So congratulations to your family uh, and we look forward to speaking to you again soon. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to this bonus episode of The Briefing. We will be back this afternoon at three with another deep dive. If you do want to keep up with our other content, we are on Instagram at The Briefing Podcast. We're also on TikTok and YouTube. Search Listener Newsroom. I'm Sasha Barbagat. See you next time. Listener.